We'll call the public safety and security policy and finance meeting to order. We'll start with the roll call. Johnson. Here. Lomer. Here. Hillstrom. Here. Becker Finn. Considine. Dean. Frankie. Here. Grossel. Here. Howe. Lucero. Newberger. Ready to serve. O'Neill. Here. Pinto. Here. Uglum. Yeah. Ward. Zerwas. Yeah. Okay, this morning we're going to do a walkthrough of the DE amendment. Oh, I'm Representative Newberger, have you had an opportunity to uh, review the minutes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. After deep study and careful examination, I find them in order. Uh, with I will move them. There it is. There it is. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is prevailed. The minutes are approved. Now we will uh, do a walkthrough of the DE amendment. And if, uh, I'm not sure which one of the. Uh, John, uh, Mr. Walt, will you uh, begin? Um, Mr. Chair, I'm going to walk through the one-page, uh, two-sided, one-page spreadsheet that is in members' packets, which um, is essentially a, a picture of Article One of the bill, and the riders in the bill should uh, match the spreadsheet. So, uh, Mr. Chair, beginning on uh, the top of the first page under Supreme Court, the House has included House File 2906 with incorrectly spelled stays of adjudication sex offenders to register. Um, there's a $182,000 uh, systems maintenance cost for the courts, and that is in uh, fiscal 2018. Moving down to the uh, district courts on line 12, uh, the, the uh, amendment includes House File 3726, Ignition Interlock. The second year, there's a $618,000 cost in 2019 and included tails. This is for one uh, judge unit and two uh, support uh, clerks. Um, Mr. Chair, moving down to line 20, the guardian ad litem. Um, the uh, amendment includes the guardian ad litem's request for compliance with mandates of 45 FTEs. Um, the governor's position was 3,667,000 uh, in fiscal 19 and 4 million in tails. The House has the uh, original request for 2019 of 3.667 million, uh, but flatlines the tails. This will um, be a, a little bit short of the request in uh, fiscal 2020 and 2021. Moving down to the Board of Public Defense, there were three bills included that uh, were fiscal noted by the Board of Public Defense that would include or require additional uh, staffing. Um, and those include House File 2932, the negligent driving with cell phones. Um, that is an $85,000 cost in 2019 and tails of 102,000 per year. On line 32, House File 2906, stays of adjudication, sex of offenders to register is 76,000 in 2019 and 153,000 annually entails. Uh, Mr. Chair, moving down to line 33, uh, House File 2944, sex offenders 25 year supervision uh, would require 689,000 for additional staffing in 2019 and uh, $2.7 million uh, each year thereafter. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, moving down to the Department of Public Safety, um, there were uh, three bills that were included that uh, have a cost at the Department of Public Safety. On line 42, House File 3296, the Vulnerable <coughs> Adults Working Group uh, receives 39,000 in fiscal year 2019. On line 43, House File 3375, Missing and Murdered Indig Indigenous Women's Task Force receives 79,000 in fiscal year 2019 and 70,000 in fiscal year 2020 and is sunsetted uh, in 2021. Um, Mr. Chair, moving down to line 46, House File 3726, Ignition Interlock 
has a $135,000 cost in 2019, $125,000 thereafter entails. This is funding from the Driver Services Fund and not the General Fund. Uh, Mr. Chair, moving then to the next page, the Department of Corrections. There are um, several bills. Many of those costs are in the tails. On line 61, uh, the uh, House file 2856 prior offense for DWI from another state would be 14,000 in 2020 and 36,000 in 2021 is the bed impact of uh, the increased penalties. On line 62, House file 2930, oh, excuse me. Uh, yes, on 62, House file 2932, negligent driving with a cell phone. Again, that one is a small bed impact beginning in 2020 of 14,000 in 2020 and 36,000 in 2021. On line 63, House File 3505, uh, again misspelled, enhanced theft penalty uh, is 14,000 in 2020 and 36,000 in 2021. House, on line 64, House File 3610, enhanced penalty for assaulting police is 28,000 in 2020 and 58,000 in 2021 for the bed impact. Uh, House File 60, on uh, line 65, House File 2409, a modify sex offender grid for child pornography offenses. Uh, bed impact in the tails 20, in fiscal year 2020, 180,000. In 2021, uh, 608,000. On line 66, House File 2906, stays of adjudication for uh, sex cases to register uh, is in fiscal year 2020, 14,000, in 2021, 43,000. On line 67, House File 2944, sex offender 25 year supervision at the Department of uh, Corrections for their um, probation officers, 500,000 in 2019, a million in 2020, and uh, 1.755 million in 2021. Uh, Mr. Chair, on line 68, the same bill, the 25-year uh, supervision the, uh, for local share, and this would go to uh, CCA counties, is a million in 2019, 1.4 million in 2020, and 2.6 million in 2021. Mr. Chair, on line 69, House File 3260, uh, Criminal sexual conduct, persons of authority, uh, is there's a small bed impact in the tails, 14,000 in 2020 and 22,000 in 2021. Um, Mr. Chair, on line 70, House File 3371, criminal sexual co conduct uh, by police for persons in custody, and there is a bed impact of 14,000 in 2020 and 36,000 in 2021. Uh, on line 71, House File 3465, criminal sexual conduct, eliminating the relationship defense, a bed impact in 2020 of 28,000 and 72,000 in 2021. Mr. Chair, on line 72, House File 4140 uh, is an escalation of the penalty for repeat patrons of uh, prostitution, uh, Bed impact in 2020 of 14,000 and 22,000 in 2021 for a total of 36,000 for the tails biennium. Mr. Chair, moving down to line 79 under the Department of Human Services, uh, House File uh, 1719 had a small uh, cost of $12,000 to the Department of Human Services to update a non paternity instructional video. And Mr. Chair, on line um, 88, uh, the House included a bill to uh, increase the dedication um, to, the, to the special revenue fund that funds the post board. There's a $172,000 impact to the general fund in 2019, 199,000 in 2020, and 192,000 in 2021. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, on the bottom line, 
uh, you will see that that meets the tail or the uh, meets the target of seven million one hundred nineteen thousand dollars in uh, fiscal eighteen and nineteen as per the budget resolution. And Mr. Chair, I'll answer any questions. Any questions from members on the spreadsheet? Mr. Chair. Representative Hillsborough. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could just uh, get some clarification on the uh, ongoing funding for the public defenders. So um, on the Board of Public Defense, actually in the bill, it uh, on line 2.16, it adds $850,000 in additional staffing. And then it says that uh, the base appropriation shall be to... Million nine hundred sixty-six thousand beginning fiscal year twenty twenty. So, is that uh, fully funding the tails of this proposal, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Hillstrom? It is fully funding the tails of the fiscal notes that were prepared by the Board of Public Defense. Um, I believe in House File twenty nine forty four, um, there may have been some additional. Um, needs identified by the public defender for um, cases revol uh, involving some of those sexual offenses that could occur beyond 2021. However, it is not common practice that we, uh, or against uh, a practice that we budget beyond the tails years. And if there were additional needs, they would have to come back in the future and um, request additional funding. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Chair and members, I'm going to walk through Article 2. Article 2 has provisions that relate to the courts. Sections 1, 2, 3, and 4 of Article 2 are all from House File 1719. That's Representative Whelan's bill related to non paternity action statute of limitations. Sections 5 and 6 of the bill are from House File 3984. That's Representative Cretia's bill modifying the appointment of counsel in juvenile court. Section 7 is from House File 3958. That's Representative Hoppe's bill related to renewal of judgment on consumer credit transactions. Section 8 is another piece from House File 1719, again, Representative Whelan's bill related to non-paternity <coughs> action statute of limitations. Section 9 is from House File 1281. That's Representative Zerwas's bill related to prejudgment interest on verdicts, awards, and judgments. The language in Section 9 is identical to the language that appeared in the 2017 omnibus bill, which limited the application to prejudgment interest only from the version of the bill that is publicly available right now. Sections 10 through 13 are all from House File 3677. These are provisions from Representative Lesh's bill related to the compensation for exonerated persons. Section 14 is House File 2855. That's Chair Johnson's bill limiting the amelioration doctrine. Sections 15, 16, 17, and 18 are additional provisions from House File 3677. Again, Representative Lush's bill related to compensation for exonerated persons. Sections 19 and 20 are from House File 2309. That is Representative Lush's bill related to tracking warrant clarification. Section 21 is the last section in Article 2. That is House File 3436. That's Representative Knobloch's bill prohibiting the use of audio and video coverage in criminal proceedings. This bill has had a slight modification from the version <laughs> presented. The version presented in committee allowed multiple individuals, including judges and attorneys, to object to the video or audio recording of a criminal proceeding. That has been limited to only the defendant and the victims. That's the end of Article 2. I'm going to move on and summarize Article 3 now. 
Article 3 contains provisions that relate to public safety and corrections. Sections 1 and 2 are from House File 2857. That's Chair Johnson's bill related to blue, rights, blue lights on tow trucks. It has undergone a very slight change that clarifies that tow trucks can use a red light, blue light, or both while they are stopped. Sections 3, 4, 5, and 6 are all from House File 3356. That's Representative Zerwas's bill related to the Public Safety Commissioner's authority to suspend driver's licenses. Section 7 and 8 are parts of House File 2934. That's Representative Grossel's bill related to stays of adjudication records being transferred to the BCA. Section 9 is House File 3554. That's Representative Hillstrom's bill related to the amount charged to counties for the cost of juvenile corrections. Section 10 is House File 3375. That's Representative Kunish Podine's bill creating a task force for missing and murdered indigenous women. This bill has been modified slightly. It now includes four legislators on the task force and it is now scheduled to sunset after two years. Section 11 is from is House File 3504. That's Representative Zerwas's bill related to gang data. Sections 12 and 13 are additional pieces of House File 2934. Representative Grossel's bill related to stays of adjudication records being transferred to the BCA. Section 14 is House File 3959. That's Chair Johnson's bill related to the disbursement of surcharges on criminal and traffic offenders, increasing the amount that is sent to the post board. Section 15 is an additional piece from Representative Grossel's House File 2934, again related to stays of adjudication records. Section 16 is House File 3611. Representative Grossel's bill related to uh, the prohibition on local <coughs> officials disarming peace officers. Section 17 is another piece from Representative Grossel's House File 2934 related to stays of adjudication records. Section 18 is House File 3296. That's Representative Keel's bill related to crimes against vulnerable <coughs> adults creating a working group. Again, this bill has been changed slightly. It's been amended to include four legislators on that working group. Section 19 is a piece of Representative Zerwas's House File 3356 related to the Public Safety Commissioner's authority to suspend driver's licenses. This is the retroactive portion and it has been changed slightly by amending the effective date. This was at the request of DVS it is now effective April 1, 2019. And with that change, there was a notification requirement in the original bill that required DVS to send out letters by December 1st, 2018. That date has been moved to May 1st, 2019. Finally, section 20 is a repealer. That's House File 3554. Representative Hillstrom's bill related to the amount charged to counties for the cost of juvenile corrections. That's the end of Article 3, and Chair Johnson, I'd ask you to recognize my colleague Jeff Diebel for Articles 4 and 5. Uh, Mr. Diebel. Mr. Chair and members, I'll walk through Articles 4, 5, and 6, beginning with Article 4, the general crime article. Sections 1 through 6 of that article Come from Representative Frankie's House File 2932, which uh, relates to criminal vehicular operation while driving a cell phone or while driving with us using a cell phone. We jump to page 42 of the delete all for section seven, which is Rep Chair Johnson's House File 3610, and this modifies the fourth degree. Um, assault statute to uh, increase the penalty for assaulting a peace officer to a felony. Section 8 
contains language from Representative Grassel's House File 1481, and this enhances penalties for assaulting medical personnel while they're uh, performing their duties. Section 9 through uh, 11 come from Representative Ward's House File 4140, and this concerns uh, prostitution offenses and the uh, penalties and sanctions that go along with those. Moving to Section 12 of Article 4. This is uh, Representative Sarah Anderson's House File 3503, and this enhances penalties for repeat theft offenses. Sections 13 and 14 come from Representative Zerwas's House File 390 and relate to obstructing traffic. Mr. Chair, that concludes the summary of Article 4. I'll move to Article 5, which is entitled Sex Offenders and begins on page 48. For this article, I'll be jumping back and forth between several bills as they modify the same statutes. Section 1 comes from Representative Grossel's House File 2906, and it requires that a judge who issues a stay of adjudication in a felony sex offense case must put the uh, justification for the approval of the stay on the record. It also requires the court to make records of stays of adjudication in criminal sexual conduct cases available via remote access through the internet. Section 2 contains pieces from two separate bills. It relates to the definition of position of authority. The definition is modified and extended to include current and recent positions of authority, as well as the cases where the person assumes the uh, responsibility. And that was, those provisions are from Representative Lomer's House File 3260. There's also a piece of Representative Christensen's House File 3203 in this section, which relates to the position of authority offense for secondary school employees and contractors and volunteers. Moving to sections three and four, these pieces also are from Representative Christensen's House File 3203 and relate to definitions that are used in the third and fourth degree criminal sexual conduct statutes. Section five is a piece from Representative Lomer's 3260 on position of authority and updates the reference to position of authority to reflect the changes in made in section two. Section six is from Representative Grossel's 2944, and it provides notice to offenders of first degree criminal sexual conduct that they are subject to extended probation, intensive probation, as well as conditional release. Section seven is a, another Section from Representative Lomer's House File 3260 related to the position of authority. Again, updating the reference to reflect the change in the definition. Section 8 is from, again, from Representative Grossel's House File 2944 related to extended probation, intensive probation, and conditional, extended conditional release. Section 9 contains pieces from three separate bills and relate to third degree criminal sexual conduct. Again, there's a piece from Representative Lomer's House File 3260, updating the reference for position of authority. There's also a section from Representative Christensen's secondary school employee uh, criminal sexual conduct bill, House File 3203. And finally, it contains Representative Fenton's, a piece of Representative Fenton's House File 3371, which relates to the prohibition on peace officers having um, uh, sexual relations with persons in their custody. Moving to section 10, relating to the penalty for criminal sexual conduct in the third degree, this is again is from Representative Grassel's bill and provides notice to offenders of their obligation 
and sanctions related to extended probation and intensive probation. Section 11 is the, um, contains again provisions from sep three separate bills and mirrors Section 9. Has a position of authority update from Representative Lomers 3260. It establishes the, um, an, includes a piece from Representative Christensen's House File 3203 related to secondary school employees and contractors and volunteers having relationships with the students and also contains a piece from Representative Fenton's Police Officer Criminal Sexual Conduct Bill, House File 3371. Section 12 is another uh, piece from Representative Grossel's 2944 related to intensive probation and extended probation. Section 13 is Representative Barr's House File 2800, which removes a piece of the sexual contact definition that is used in fifth degree criminal sexual conduct so that it is uh, no longer an exception to that crime to intentionally touch another person's uh, buttocks over their clothing with sexual intent. Section 14 provides, uh, is from House File 2904, which is Representative Grossel's bill. And again, provides notice to offenders of uh, criminal sexual conduct in the fifth degree that they are subject to conditional release, extended probation, and intensive probation. Sections 15 through 18 are from Representative Grossel's um, House File 2944, which relate to the 25 year conditional release uh, term imposed on offenders who commit felony level criminal sexual conduct offenses, as well as intensive probation and extended probation. Moving to sections 19 through 28, these are from Representative Grossel's House File 2904, which relate to his child pornography penalty enhancements and mandatory minimum sentences. So again, that's section, that bill covers from sections 19 through 28 of Article 5. The final section in Article 5 is a repealer, and that comes from Representative Hortman's House File 3465. And this is the repeal of the marital rape exception. That concludes my summary of Article 5. Pending any questions, I'll move to Article 6, which is entitled Predatory Offenders. This article is comprised predominantly of the BCA's agency bill on the Predatory Offender Registry, House File 3578, with one exception. In Article 3, or excuse me, in Section 3, there is a piece from Representative Grossel's House File 2906. And that piece requires persons who are issued a stay of adjudication for a criminal sexual conduct offense to register as a predatory offender based on that resolution of their case. Otherwise, the entire article is from House File 3578, which was brought to the legislature by the BCA and was passed without amendment. Ex oh, excuse me, with one amendment from the Department of Corrections related to clarifying their, the ability for a predatory offender to travel internationally and their duty to receive approval from their corrections agent prior to uh, traveling outside the country. Mr. Chair, I'd ask that you recognize my colleague, Mr. Johnson, to summarize Article 7. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Chair and members, Article 7 contains provisions related to driving while intoxicated. Section 1 is Chair Johnson's House File 2856. This is the bill that deals with the prior offense in another state being included to support a first degree charge in Minnesota. The remaining sections, sections 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, are all from Representative O'Neill's House File 3726, 
Those provisions all related to ignition interlock for repeat offenders. There was one slight technical change in that uh, in these provisions that you did not see previously, and that simply added some clarifying language related to Chapter 171. Those does, that does not have any actual effect other than clarifying that the provisions of this bill apply to violations of the driver's license requirements in chapters 169 a 52 169 a 54 and the new chapter 171.177 that concludes the summary of article 7 and the full bill walkthrough mr chair thank you representative hillstrom thank you mr chair if i could get some clarification uh, either from the author or from staff um, on page 61, uh, line 61.27, um, terms of conditional release, um, fifth degree control, uh, fifth, de fifth degree crim sex, uh, the felony level is added under the terms of conditional release. However, it's not referenced in the mandatory 25 year conditional release term on line 60.11 is where that starts. Uh, my question is, um, is it the author's intention to um, not have it be there, or was it a uh, cross-referencing oversight, or is it the intent that conditional release shall apply but not extending it to 25 years? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hillstrom, it, it would be the intent to have that on there as well. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the uh, it is your intention that the cross-references should be added then to the 25-year conditional release and that fifth-degree uh, fifth degree criminal sexual conduct at the felony level would be subject to 25 years of conditional release. Yes. Any, any other questions from the members? Representative Cornish. Or Constantine. It's been a long couple weeks. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I had a very small wording change that would allow us to prosecute people that were intentionally trying to have infectious disease passed to custody officers and police. Um, I'm not seeing that in the bill. <laughs> on the general re register is direct sent to the floor and we're going to see that on the floor I I am hoping we do I have no control over that part of it um, boy I would have liked to have seen it in the omnibus bill Mr. Chair. representative zero the uh, the majority leaders office handles calendaring of bills if you made a request for your bill to be calendared? No, I was expecting it to be in the omnibus bill. After it got past the general register. I must have misunderstood the chair. That was the day they started yelling right in my ear when I was up front, so I probably didn't even hear what he said. Any other questions from members? Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if we could just get some clarification um, on the record, just so the public knows before the any testimony about when amendments are due and uh, when you intend to vote on this bill. Uh, amendments are due at three o'clock today. Um, we will be going. We'll have some testimony from the people who have signed up today, and then tomorrow we'll work mark up the bill. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so it is your intention that all public testimony should be taken today and that there won't be public testimony tomorrow when we're doing amendments. That is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Okay, we'll start with uh, Mr. Chair. Can I just a quick question? Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, was the when was the bill posted? Um, if I may ask, like, when would it have been made available to the public? It was posted around one o'clock yesterday. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> I will start with Commissioner Roy. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members, Tom Roy, Commissioner of Corrections. Uh, Mr. Chair, we've been advised that there are some kind time constraints on our testimony. Uh, we, we, we have some leeway. We have till. Uh, have, have some time we got through this a little quicker than we expected but we do have a number of people who do wish to testify right we'll be I will be efficient in the use of your time I have staff in the room that are available for questions with uh, can provide more specificity I am here to address the three governor's recommendations for our budget and in, in your line item spreadsheet those would be lines 58, 59, and 60. Line 58 specifically is for offender health care. The governor is recommending 7.8 million. Uh, there is no funding indicated from this committee, which of course is a concern to us. If you recall last year, it was very uh, pointed out very obviously that only one year of our health care contract was going to be funded because we were in the midst of an RFP and contract negotiations. I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that those <laughs> negotiations are done. We have uh, were able to secure a five year contract and the 7.8 million that the governor is asking for and that we are asking for is to accommodate the new contract for fiscal year 19. As you folks know, we are constitutionally required to provide health care to our offenders. It is a very expensive proposition to do that. We have an annual expenditure of about $94 million, and that expenditure includes psychological services, chemical dependency treatment, our nursing staff, uh, sex offender treatment, which should be of interest to this committee, uh, and all of that under the umbrella of behavioral health. S moving on to line 59, the governor is recommending 710,000 for the opioid initiative. That is a small portion of the governor's proposal of 13 million or so. We hope to include and provide services, transitional services for people with opioid addictions leaving our prisons. And that will be not only in the terms of uh, providing a higher level of transitional services provided by medical release planners, but also to fund medically assisted treatment, which is the uh, a national initiative, uh, and that is to provide medicine before our offenders are released so that their cravings are reduced upon release. Uh, our offenders have a high risk of overdosing upon release because they often re-engage in use of opioids at the same level that they were using before they went in and their tolerance level is greatly reduced. And if, in fact, they use at that high level, they often die. So we are, uh, I believe, the smallest part of the opioid initiative 
but very important work for us. And moving on to line 60 of the spreadsheet, our population per diem. As you folks know, and I have talked to you numerous times over the years about projecting prison population, that it's not an exact science. And we have found that our projections that we initially started working on in 2016 and established basically three years ago for 2019 are showing that we have uh, underestimated prison population and the request for 7.864 is to accommodate the added beds and not only for prison beds but for those county beds as well. I should along with that give you folks some good news. We are in a small trend downward in terms of the amount of county beds that we are currently renting. I think at one time I presented to this committee that our county bed rental was in the 500 range and I'm glad to report that this week we are renting 120 beds. Uh, that <clears throat> is always risky to tell you folks that and the reason it is a bit risky is because those trend lines can change very dramatically very quickly. Yesterday I heard testimony in the Senate from some folks behind me from Department of Public Safety, a, a uh, growth in drug related arrests and seizures and a 10 year, I believe it was over 500% increase in 10 years. So uh, the drug crisis is with us and unfortunately lots of those cases turn into prison sentences and it's very possible that our initiatives to reduce prison population will be affected by those increases in prison sentences. You folks have heard that uh, the governor is not interested in addressing specific policies and my discussion this morning will only re relate to the three items that I have just talked about. So I stand ready for questions regarding those and um, there are details that are available if uh, you need further specificity. Representative Lomar. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Roy, for being here this morning. So we've talked about this a little bit uh, a week ago or so, but um, I have some concerns in my district. I have two prisons, Oak Park Heights and Stillwater, and in the last couple weeks we've had some incidences there where uh, prison guards were injured and went to the hospital and, and so on. And, and so I guess my question is, um, and, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there were some changes to the segregation policies last year to 90 days. And this seems to be um, maybe one of the reasons for the increases. Um, and just wondering if there will be any changes back to uh, maybe some more um, disincentivizing for people to be um, getting into any kind of confrontations with with the guards and my, my big concern is most of these folks live in my district these guards have a very dangerous and difficult job and I just want to know how we can protect them and how we can um, make them do their job in the safest way possible we all know it's a very dangerous job anyway but I'm just really concerned about that so if maybe you could address that for me thank Mr. you Commissioner Wright. Mr. Chair Representative we share that concern every day. Safety is our highest priority in our prison system. The uh, correction I would immediately make to your comments are that there, the 90 day, it's been described as a 90 day cap. 
on assaults on staff, and that is an inaccurate assessment and description of the process. The 90-day uh, is a minimum, <coughs> and at the 90-day mark, we start a step-down process that is very detailed, and I can provide the committee and others with a description of that step-down process, but that step-down process can be up to a year or longer if, in fact, there isn't good compliance with the steps. Uh, we have built in incentives for good behavior, and the recognition nationally for supporting a step-down process is that we know we can't keep people segre in segregated population forever. We know that those people will be coming back into general population or being released into the community. So it's extremely important that we incentivize those offenders to become involved in counseling, to become involved in positive behaviors, and re-enter either general population for the rest of their lives, in some cases, or return to the community in better shape. Uh, an interesting statistic that not too many people know about, and it's a national statistic, that there are about 14,000 people currently in this country who have been in segregation for over one year. 14,000. That number changes every day, of course, but we'll use that as a rough number. In Minnesota, I'm going to ask you to maybe give a five-second speculation of what you think the number of people in segregation over a year in Minnesota is right today. Six. Seven. We have seven people over a year. The other statistic that goes with that is that four of those seven want to remain in segregation for safety reasons, for mental health reasons. Uh, so we uh, have constant attention to that population. Statistically, that's as, as much as I'm going to give you. But to your question, can we attribute recent assaults to policy. The conundrum that that question presents to me is that there's an expectation that I would know or staff would know what the motivations are for offenders to commit assaults. That would mean I would have to be in the head of that offender when he commits the assault. I long ago gave up trying to, with 100% certainty, explain why people commit crimes. In these assault cases, we have seen some dynamics of personal vendettas. We have seen gang activity. We have seen street violence that has spilled over into the prisons that has led to some violence. And we have seen mental health uh, people with difficulties controlling their behaviors because of mental health issues. So I cannot, with any degree of certainty, tell you that our segregation initiative, which falls into a national initiative, has attributed anything to those assaults. Um, I just can't do that this morning. I, have, I am totally... Uh, and as a person, as an officer in my former days, I was locked in cells with newly arrested individuals. Three years, my first three years of my career were in a county jail system. As a part of my job, I was locked in the cell with individuals that we, nobody knew anything about. I get safety. I know what it is all about. I am as concerned as you are and as the gentlemen in the back are uh, who daily walk into very high stress 
prisons and do work that most citizens won't even think of doing. And I, this topic of assaults on staff is getting the highest attention from our administration that we can possibly give it. I will be saying these same words to uh, representatives of uh, those corrections officers tomorrow morning. We have shared those words numerous times and uh, it's a sad thing when a staff gets assaulted. I hope I have satisfied your question. Representative Lomar. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate your answer and I appreciate all that, that you do. I'm, I guess I'm just, and I, it sounds to me like you're working on it, but just looking for maybe ideas, other tools, if segregation isn't, you know, you know are there other um, ideas that you've come up with to de-incentivize um, folks from, from these behaviors? So um, thank you for working on that. Thank you for your concern. Uh, Commissioner Roy, I, I too have concerns about this issue. I have uh, one of the facilities in my district. I've talked to a number of the staff, that, not only there, but around the state, and they have a lot of concerns. Uh, this is something that does need to be addressed and addressed quickly. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help you solve these issues, please let us know and we'll do what we can. Mr. Chair, I do have some ideas that you can help with. Representative Zerwaz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Roy, for coming down and, and, and talking a little bit um, about this issue. Obviously, we want all of all state employees, but uh, certainly all of your corrections officers, uh, to be as safe as possible inside uh, the prison. Um, to be to be really clear, uh, in the in the uh, last year's legislation um, that ended up not being included in the final bill and not signed into law and not law, not becoming law, in that discussion around um, segregation um, and, and secure housing, um, the legislation that we were working on talked about uh, accountability measures as far as who would have to be made aware of, uh, of an incident where individuals stay uh, in segregation past certain lengths of time, including uh, finally, the commissioner uh, approving or signing off uh, 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 past a, a certain time. I believe it was 60 days in the in the legislation. Um, just because I think accountability matters, and, and then the other part of that uh, uh, bill talked about data and getting reports back to the legislature about how many people have been in. Uh, restricted housing or, or segregation um, for what types of infractions and for what lengths of time. Um, for a myriad of reasons, th that proposal didn't uh, become law last year. And I'm just wondering if the commissioner, uh, what your thoughts are on providing some reporting aspects uh, back to the legislature. Because um, I think that would be helpful. I know um, several of us uh, even those that serve on this committee for years were surprised with some of the numbers that came out in the Star Tribune uh, series of stories that talked about individuals uh, being in solitary confinement for four, five, six, seven hundred days, and some individuals being in solitary confinement for four, five, six, seven hundred days, and then immediately being uh, released not to general population, but literally out the front door of the prison after being in isolation for years. I, for one, don't believe that's a recipe for success. And so the request in the legislation was never in the language and how it was proposed and how it was discussed, was never to limit uh, the commissioner or his staff's ability to use segregation as a tool for safety and a tool to manage behavior, but it was around the idea of, of helping to counter what I believe is the misnomer that people are 
thrown in the hole and kind of forgotten about. And that was the story we heard over and over and over. And so I think one way to do that is to ensure there's accountability uh, that goes through the warden of the prison and to the commissioner and that there's a report back to the legislature so that if there are uh, six individuals that are uh, in isolation for a year, um, that we have, um, that we can speak to that and, and understand, you know, how that makes sense, why that makes sense, and, and, and to also um, put at ease the idea that the system is not being implemented uh, surgically and, and, and very uh, prescriptive. And so um, tomorrow, I again will be bringing forward a, an amendment that looks for uh, the reporting aspect of my bill from last year and hoping that the numbers that I believe the department is already collecting would be provided to the legislature on an annual basis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Zerwas. If you're bringing that amendment for reporting another piece that you should request in your report, and I was going to ask the commissioner if he could make it available to us. Under Minnesota statute 609.2232, it is already the law that these inmates should be receiving consecutive sentences for assaults that they commit while they are in prison. I mean, it even includes a misdemeanor or gross misdemeanor should be consecutive. And so it's my understanding that there is an issue on whether or not uh, those uh, cases are sentenced consecutively or concurrently. Um, that law was passed in 1997. When I first got to the legislature, we uh, had another bill to say it shall be uh, consecutive, um, not concurrent. And they said that's already the law. And so we said we were going to put it in the statute to say we really meant it. Um, and again, uh, this legislature, I think, really means it. And so if we could get some information as well in that report about are these folks being sentenced consecutively or concurrently, that might uh, enlighten us. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Commissioner, thank you for your work and testimony. I, um, I guess I'll admit that I hadn't really focused on the health care contract issue. It just kind of hadn't been top of mind for me. And I found it a, a little bit alarming. Um, can you just describe if that money, and, and maybe I missed this in the early testimony, my apologies if so, but um, I mean, the DOC is required constitutionally to to provide health care to offenders. I would argue it's also just a moral obligation. Once society's decided we're going to take somebody's freedom away for very good reasons, um, we then have an obligation to, to meet those needs. Um, what happens if that funding does not come through um, this year? Commissioner Roy. Mr. Chair, Nan Larson, our health care director, will be sitting next to me, and she can uh, speak to that. Uh, Ms. Larson. <laughs> Mr. Chair, for the record, my name is Nan Larson. I'm the Health Services Director for the Department of Corrections. Um, Representative Pinto, in response to your question, um, really good, we're going to have to find the funding elsewhere. We have a contract. Um, we have to provide health care. We don't get to pick and choose who comes to us, so we can't take the sick ones and say bye, go back to the community. So we have to provide care to them, so we will have to find funding elsewhere. Um, the commissioner mentioned uh, what my budget entails. So my budget includes chemical dependency counseling, sex offender treatment, um, and we'd have to take probably funding out of those areas to fund the contract. So that means less CD treatment, less sex offender treatment. Uh, Mr. Chair, just to follow up. Thank you. So, it, I mean, it, so it sounds like you you will be spending the 7.8 million. You will be spending 7.8 million dollars more on the health care contract. That's budget, and that's just required. So, I guess the issue is going to be then. We'll be having you make the decision of what else gets cut, rather than us. Uh, than, rather than us making that decision, essentially, because because that's what the position we'd be forcing you into by not having this funding. If, is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Arthur. Pinto, you are correct. We would be making that decision because we'd have to find the funding elsewhere. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, Commissioner, as we're to get back to Representative Lomer's question, as we're talking about preventing uh, 
preventing violence and preventing assault against uh, staff in the facilities, I mean, it seems to me would providing health care and providing treatment, you know, chemical dependency treatment, opioid treatment, would that potentially lead to preventing some of those assaults and acting out on, um, in your opinion? Commissioner Wright. Mr. Chair, Representative, we, we believe that all of our prison programming, our vocational work, our educational work, our treatment, all leads to a healthier prison environment. And everybody, I think, is in agreement that uh, a healthy environment reduces stress, it reduces assaults. And if we can get to those core character <coughs> traits that lead to violence with violence prevention programming, uh, it's a better day for everybody. And if, uh, if you saw the headlines tomorrow, Department of Corrections plans to release 8,000 people in 2019, I think that headline would get your attention. Guess what? That is what we're going to do. 8,000 of our folks in prison are going to be our neighbors. We have an absolute obligation to assure our citizens that we are doing the best we can in terms of treatment. We have an obligation to our staff to de-escalate violence and all that types of programming uh, accomplish that. Uh, Mr. Chair. Representative becker -Finn. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chair. Uh, so just to be clear, as we talk about what we can do to help you to prevent the violence that happens in the facilities, it's things like the opioid treatment and funding the health care contracts so that you don't have to take that money away from other programs that will help you in addressing the, the assaults in the facilities. Mr. Chair, Representative, Mr. that funding is critical and we have over the years asked for additional corrections officers. If you recall, I talk about it all the time, we did a staffing analysis and we, we need over 100 officers to bring our complement up. And Mr. Chair, your offer to help, uh, obviously it won't be this year, but some future commissioner will be asking the same question of this committee and the same request. I, I hope you're sincere in, in your hope to help us out because we need officers. Thank you. Representative Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner. We will be releasing 8,000, but we'll also be admitting another 8,000. So the net is going to probably be zero. Um, when I look at this health care contract and the added costs for offenders, and I don't know if it was two years ago that we allocated extra money for chemical dependency treatment and mental health treatment three years ago. Uh, so, so really what we're doing is we're taking away that money that we actually allocated because now you're going to have to utilize that money. So our efforts a few years ago to increase uh, the funding for mental health treatment, which could be uh, related to some of the uh, assaults on officers, as well as chemical dependency, uh, is now going to be kicked back down. So I, I, I think that when we fund these types of um, initiatives to try to address public safety, not only for when individuals get outside, but also why they're inside, um, they will actually create a real difficult situation, not just for you, but, but for everyone else uh, relative to that, whether it's while the offender is locked up or why the offender is released. Um, I mean, I, 7.8 million is more than we got in, in our whole budget for this this committee. So um, I, I appreciate that uh, the governor has put this forward, and I hope that as we move uh, through the rest of this legislative session that we'll actually be able to find you the money uh, to assure that our offenders are getting the, um, the health care that is required in our Constitution. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I need to clarify something to make it Mr. crystal Wright. clear. This health care contract is 
the unfunded fiscal year 19, we should have been funded 18, 19, but if you recall, we said that we were renegotiating the contract. Senate House all agreed that I would come back and tell you about the new RFP and the response to the contract, which is actually $3 million less than last year's request. So the re renegotiating of the contract uh, is very attractive and uh, this is how we agreed to do business. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Very, very brief. So I just want to make sure I understand. So if we had funded, if you hadn't told us to sort of back off on year two, we presumably would have given you $10 million for year two, and now you've saved us $3 million, and you're just asking for the $7 million that's less than we, you would have asked for last year. Mr. Chair. Sometimes the news is good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other, well, anyone else on the committee have a question? Okay, thank you, Commissioner Roy. Appreciate the time, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dol Dolman. Unfortunately, that one took a lot longer time than I expected. <laughs> he always does that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members. Good morning. For the record, my name is Mona Dolman, and I'm the Commissioner of Public Safety. And I appreciate the opportunity. I will be brief to just uh, talk with you about this omnibus bill. I'd like to start by thanking you for the support of the work that we do at the Department of Public Safety. I respect and appreciate the difficult decisions that you are faced with in juggling the competing interests <coughs> presented as you work to meet your targets in this supplemental budget. Public safety is one of government's core functions and at the Department of Public Safety it's, it is our core mission. I want to thank you for including Representative Hillstrom's House File 3578, which is the Department of Public Safety's predatory offender registration policy proposal this year. The BCA runs Minnesota's predatory offender registration program and brings these changes forward as they prepare to upgrade the system, which was funded during the 2017 <coughs> session, and I thank you for that as well. As you learned in a previous hearing on this bill, these changes update registration requirements clarify notification requirements, bring us into compliance with International Megan's Law governing those who are required to register, who will be traveling overseas, and ensures that correction agents can share information for <laughs> child protection studies. It's unfortunate that we did not have an opportunity to present the governor's supplemental budget proposals to this committee. Governor Dayton, Dayton's proposals in his supplemental budget are our priorities and I hope that you will reconsider and fully fund our proposal. The governor's proposal has two parts. The first is he recommends funding to increase the number of drug scientists in the, at the BCA drug chemistry lab to reduce the turnaround time for drug evidence examination. Our goal is to get turnaround time down to 30 days. The second part is his, in his proposal also increases the number of investigators to support tribal nations, and DEA prescrip uh, prescription diversion efforts across the state. The proposal supports a total of nine full-time employees. Not fully funding these proposals will greatly reduce the impact of the criminal justice system and the court system. Full funding will speed the ability for individuals to enter into drug court or drug treatment, among other things. These proposals are part of, a larger, a part of the larger opioid action plan. They are strategic investments that support our communities, the ones that you represent and the ones that we serve. I believe that it's money well spent for the safety of Minnesotans. I'd just ask, like to ask that you fully fund the proposals as are spelled out in the governor's supplemental budget. For fiscal year 19, this would be $1.432 million from the general fund. And for years 20 and 21, it would be an additional $1.154 million each year from the proposed um, opioid stewardship program, which is the penny of pill, penny of pill discussion. The last item of concern I'd like to comment on is that, pe that a piece of this bill includes funding from the Driver and Vehicle Services Special Revenue Account to implement the in ignition interlock uh, changes included in this bill. We remain concerned with the multitude of bills 
moving through this legislative process uh, that take funds from the driver and vehicle services accounts. And I just request that these overall impacts to the funds be taken into consideration. Thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Chair and members, and I look forward to working with you as we move through this legislative process. Thank you. Any questions from the committee members? Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, for all the work that you guys do over there. I do have a question about the opioid treatment and prevention programs that the governor is proposing on the penny of pill. Um, been doing some work with Representative Baker on the opioid epidemic. And if we do fund his bill separately, will that line up with the governor's proposal? Do you know where those items lie within Baker, Representative Baker's bill versus the governor's initiative? Commissioner Doman. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative, I would have to go back and look. I don't know the answer to that right now, but I can certainly get back to you. Thanks. Representative becker -Pin. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real quick uh, for the public's benefit uh, on the demand for narcotic in investigations. Um, Heroin-related seizures are up more than 5,000%. And I just wanted to highlight that because that's a really, really large increase, and it makes sense that you would be asking for more funds, I think, when you look at that increase just from 2016 to 2017. That's in incredible. Thank you. Superintendent Evan. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative, we just would like to comment. We agree that it's incredible, and it's a number that we included in here because it illustrates the problem um, that the seizures are from our drug task forces across Minnesota. This isn't limited to one pocket of the state. This isn't limited to one community. And all the communities which you represent are experiencing these significant increases in drug and drug-related issues across Minnesota. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Caroline Palmer. Welcome to the committee and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Caroline Palmer and I'm the Public and Legal Affairs Manager at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I'm just going to be brief. I'm, I'm really just here to thank the committee, thank the chair, thank the committee members, uh, thank the bill authors and co-authors that are here on the committee for um, paying such close attention to sexual violence issues and related issues uh, this session. And um, we really appreciate all of the policy and actions that are here in the proposals. So I just wanted to put that forward and, and again give our thanks on behalf of all of the sexual assault advocacy programs across the state. And I also wanted to um, additionally support the fact that um, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Task Force is included in here as I discussed in front of the committee. Sexual assault is certainly an issue that factors into that conversation and also the attention being paid to vulnerable adults. That's another area um, where we see high numbers of sexual abuse. So again, I just wanted to thank the committee for all of your efforts and support. Thank you. Any questions from members? Thank you very much. Joel Carlson. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and proceed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Joel Carlson. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Association for Justice, and I want to talk to you briefly about uh, Article 2, Section 9, a provision that I dislike a little bit more this year than I liked last year. Uh, I want you to know that, that Section 9 of, of the bill will delay claims paid to your constituents. It will reduce what they're compensated when they've been injured by others. <laughs> Uh, and it will actually increase litigation in Minnesota. I just like this provision a little more this year because it ignores what's really going on in Minnesota courts. The Supreme Court tells us that civil case filings for injury cases, which are subject to this provision, are down an additional 12% between 2016 and 2017, and they are down 42% in the last 10 years. That ironically is the same period of time when we changed the judgment interest rate to the current 10%. <laughs> Civil appeals are down since this law was changed almost 
30% because we now have incentive to pay claims and not to just needlessly delay them and drag them out. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce says Minnesota has one of the best civil litigation systems for corporate defendants in the country. And there were about 125 judgments, civil trial judgments, entered last year. That's it. That's what we're talking about. That is the entire case field that were tried to judgment. And let's remember what we're talking about here. These are judgments. These aren't frivolous matters. These are instances where the court or a trier of fact has determined that you have been harmed by someone else and that you're entitled to compensation. And let's remember what this interest is for. This is to compensate you for the loss of use of your money that someone has taken from you. And I like this bill a little bit less this year because the interest rates are up. Credit Karma, which makes us sign up to arbitrate with them if we use their service, tells us that a low interest credit card right now, a low interest credit card is 13.5%. That's the low one. This will not compensate you for the loss of use of your money. It will not provide prompt payment. There is no incentive to pay, and I'll get to this in a second, uh, when you reduce judgment interest to 4%. And this will, will delay settlement of claims and it will produce additional litigation and appeals. There is no question about it. This bill runs counter to everything, every purpose for why we have post-judgment interest. So what is this bill really about? This bill is about insurance companies being able to retain your premium dollars for as long as they can. And we see it every day. We all see flow, don't we? Insurance companies spend $7 billion a year, all paid for through our premiums, to get your premium dollar in the door. GEICO spent $4.5 million, more than the amount spent on judgment interest in Minnesota, for a 30-second spot during the Super Bowl. $4.5 million. They want to keep that money, and this I'll just close with this, Mr. Chair and members. The reason they want to keep your money longer was told to us by State Farm when they, re when they released their 2017 um, annual financial report. They had big catastrophic losses from storm damage in 2017. They lost $1.7 billion on their net premiums. The company's net worth during that same period of time increased by $10 billion. How did that happen? Because they're able to retain your premium dollars, invest it in the market and not get 2 or 4% like they want to pay, but get substantially beyond that. And that's what this bill is really all about. It's about them retaining your premiums and being able to invest it to make their net worth go up $10 billion at a time when their operating loss was $1.7 billion. This bill runs counter to what we want to have happen in our civil courts. I like Representative Zerwas every day even more, but I dislike this proposal even more this year because times have changed and it's even more important now that we allow consumers to get compensated for the money that they've lost and been wrongly taken from them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm happy to answer questions. Representative Zerwas. Well, uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, this, is a, this is a provision in the bill we talk about every year. And, uh, and every year we have more and more states going the exact direction that, that this bill would propose to take Minnesota. And that is bring that interest rate more in line uh, with, with accurate market uh, conditions. And, and remember um, how we've ferreted this bill out uh, compared to the original version in that we are just talking about um, interest uh, after the judgment. And so we're, the idea that this somehow is going to incent uh, cases to be dragged out, that's, that's just not the case. And, and so I think what's, in, what's important with the bill is that it treats 
it treats everybody equally. Remember that this change in the interest rate, the legislature already did for ourselves. We already did it for government. And so I think if it was good for the government, it's good for the rest of Minnesotans. We've passed the bill off the floor of the House before. I'm excited that the bill's added uh, once again uh, to the chairman's uh, omnibus bill, and I look forward to the debate on the floor. I, I tried to save you time, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I agree with Mr. Carlson. And um, members, we see this provision every year in this bill or in this committee. Um, however, in all sorts of other committees, we set interest rates that people can charge that are in business. And so currently, there is a proposal to allow um, storage companies to charge you 15% for late payments. So while we want to lower insurance rates, um, insurance companies and what they have to pay when they keep your money after they've already found to have harmed you, we continue to charge consumers more and more and more. And I just think it's the wrong direction. So you'll see an amendment tomorrow to take it out. And Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carlson. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, Representative Zerwes, I think we have it flipped a little bit. You're right. You're right. This bill does deal with prejudgment interest only. It is the factor that allows for delay and stalling. And, you know, these people are not on your side. You're not in good hands. They use every loophole, <laughs> exclusion, uh, you know. And when you compare us with other states, we are not out of line. But this is not a savings rate. This is what you have to borrow while you're fighting through a case. And that's what you're trying to replace. That's why I think the 4% is so unfair. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. You've always been gracious about hearing us out on this issue. And hopefully uh, uh, we can once again be successful and get this one out of there. Well, you know. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Carlson. Jerry Perkis. Mr. Perkis, welcome to the committee. Please state your uh, name for the record and proceed. Welcome, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jerry Perkis, I'm a correctional officer, Moose Lake uh, Correctional Facility. Been there for 27 years. I also serve on the Council 5 Executive Board. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the opportunity to testify this morning on File 2856, Public Safety Bill. To start, I'd like to thank all the members on proving the state contract and Governor Dayton's signature. However, what I speak on is the funding um, for correctional officers, additional funding for correctional officers. Um, as testified earlier, um, we have come several years and asked for more funding for correctional officers. We're short of over 100 positions. And still we get no bail out of this. As a result, that staff and inmates are more likely to be put in harm's way. Um, we heard it with the recent reports of assaults. I'm here to, and we are here to encourage the committee to sincerely look at ways to increase the number of the COs in these facilities, to maintain order of our prisons, ensure staff and inmates sa safety, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Jim Barbo. Uh, Mr. Chair and oh. members of the committee, my name is Jim Barbo. I've been a correctional officer at Moose Lake for 21 years. I'm currently holding the position of a canine handler. Uh, and I also serve as my local's union president. I too would like to thank the governor and this committee and the legislative group for passing our contract and funding the fundings that you've done so far. We are concerned about the lack of funding for the offender health care contract and also for the offender per diem increase. The department requested 7.8 million in 2018 and 19 and 6.5 million in 2020 and 21. The lack of this funding will have a direct impact on how the work is done. Uh, this work directly affects me 
and my family and my community. Without the funding, permanent cuts are likely to occur to the department and their budget. Um, we are already experiencing the effects not enough staff have on in our work areas. The cuts and the numbers of SEALs would be drastically reduced, in my belief, if we don't do the proper <coughs> funding. As the representative here asked, the question is, are we going to have to pay for these? Yes, we will. It doesn't matter if you pass this funding or not today or tomorrow. The funding has to be done. And we will take these cuts somewhere. And that will probably be during programming and in the staffing numbers. And those numbers and those programming will have a dramatic effect on our security of these facilities. Um, without the funding of this health care contract, we as SEALs, we could be laid off, but we will be doing more overtime. The reason we do overtime is because we have a 24-7 operation. We don't go home at 5 o'clock. We're there 24-7. Uh, the, the critical, without the pro providing this critical resource, the health care contract this year, it will only make the necessary mm -hmm. cost of this to increase <coughs> as the years go on. I've been an officer for 21 years. I've been fortunate through my department and through the union to go to numerous states for uh, conferences, training, and Minnesota was held at a higher level, which I was always told when I came and started my career that we were up here. And it truly was. I thought maybe we were just blowing smoke at me. We were held up here. We are now coming down with, with the rest of the states. We are doing what they said don't do because we did it and we had issues. We had staffing concerns. We were not funding what we had to do properly to fund, which now becomes security of our facilities. We are doing that. They don't come and ask us anymore, can we see what you're doing? We are following them. Let's become the leaders that we used to be. And that takes money and funding. I know you guys have been asked before to come do tours in our facilities. I'm not going to ask you to do a tour. I'm going to request you to come put on this uniform, walk with us in those halls for an eight-hour hour, for an eight-hour day, maybe two days, and see what you're not doing the funding, how it affects us. It not only affects us, our family, our community. Thank you. I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, Representative Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming to testify, um, both of you. Uh, <coughs> I don't really have a question, but I have a comment for, for you and for the committee. Thank you for your work. And um, some of us have toured, and I'm reminded of a variety of institutions. If you don't have the staff, if you don't have the opportunity to provide the programming, the health care, mental health services, then there are going to be problems. Um, mental and physical health go with uh, all sorts of the uh, vocational programming. Uh, if people are kept busy in constructive ways where they have some hope and, and can see a, a, a future for themselves, then your job is more reasonable. It's a tough position to be in. And, and I'm just disappointed that we are not providing the resources that uh, corrections and public safety need in order to do their job and to keep us safe. I want to say thank you. I appreciate it. I don't disagree with you. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I too want to thank uh, Mr. Barbo and Mr. Furcus for their for their work. I think it was the commissioner who said before that um, that uh, it's work that so many of us would not even consider um, at all. And as I'm a prosecutor, and um, and I can say I, I would not want to be interacting daily with many of the folks that I'm sending to then that you all are dealing with and on the front lines. Um, and I guess I just want to emphasize, and your your um, comments made me think about this that um, it's pretty easy for us to. Uh, to you know, pass um, laws, rules, policies, whatever it is, but it's the people on the front lines implementing them um, who have to actually do that work. And what I'm hearing from you is saying, look, um, if we get squeezed in one area in healthcare, uh, then uh, and we bring the money from someplace else, then that's hurting programming that is going to be 
making us less safe. And if our big concern is assaults on, on correctional officers and others, um, you're telling us um, the way to prevent those is by making sure that we have a robust and fully funded system, including some more correctional officers. So I just want to um, lift up what you're saying and, and support and, and thank you very much for the work you do both um, at Moose Lake and then certainly here as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Max Hall. And members, we do have two more testifiers that had signed up after the agenda was presented. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have a uniform, but I'll, I'll give this a go anyway. Um, my name is Max Hall. Uh, I'm a legislative representative of AFSCME Council 5. Uh, Council 5 of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees represents approximately 43,000 men and women uh, who work for the state and local units of government. Um, as you've heard, of two, heard from two correctional officers uh, of our membership, we represent more than 2,000 correctional officers uh, in this state, as well as uh, about 200 guardians ad litem. Um, so my testimony will be focused on the guardian ad litem program. Um, House File 2856, as uh, obviously you're aware, Mr. Chairman, uh, includes uh, supplemental funding for the guardian ad litem program. Uh, in terms of funding 45 additional FTEs. So I want to sincerely thank you, Mr. Chairman, for putting that, that funding in, uh, as well as Representative Hillstrom's work uh, in, in supporting that program. We really appreciate both of you um, and other members. Uh, we are really proud to represent guardians ad litem um, and strongly support them in their work to protect children and ensure they're placed in supportive and safe households. Uh, as, a re as a result of the Office of Legislative Auditor's report, which this committee has heard, um, the, the need for additional staffing is, is uh, critically warranted. Um, and so, uh, again, um, their work uh, needs to be supported, though, uh, with ongoing uh, funding. So that's really critical. Um, I had the opportunity to shadow several of our members, uh, guardians ad litem, at the Stearns County Courthouse. They do extraordinary work uh, in order to prepare reports and and documentation for the court uh, in order for judges to make proper decisions uh, for child placement. It's a very critical component of our judicial system. Um, so making sure that every child has that representation um, is absolutely necessary, and this funding at least gets us to a, a good standard to, to make that a reality. Uh, so Mr. Chair, you including this funding clearly shows that you prioritize uh, the protection of children. Uh, and the notion that every child ought to have representation in the court system. And so I'll conclude with saying thank you again. Thank you. I'm open for questions if there are any. Okay. Uh, court. Fulton. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and proceed. Um, Court Halton, I represent the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. <clears throat> this will be about 30 seconds, Mr. Chairman. I'm here to, just to put on a record the fact that um, we, there's a, <clears throat> we believe there's an unintended consequence in Article 3, Section 16, which is on page 33. <clears throat> That's Representative Grossel's uh, bill on, on uh, disarming police officers. And I'm just here today to say that we're going to uh, c come forward with language provided that Representative Grossel agrees to it, and I'm just here in the interest of transparency to put that on your radar. Thank you. Lori Kersick. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Lori Cusick. I'm the Guardian Ad Litem Program Manager in Hennepin County. Um, I would like to start by thanking uh, the group for having us here on behalf of the State Guardian Ad Litem Program and myself. Um, as the Program Manager in Hennepin County, we are dealing with 25% approximately of the child protection cases in the state of Minnesota. And I wanted to come here and talk a little bit about the situation in Hennepin County and why we are um, appreciative and looking for support for our program in order to um, be able to um, have more guardians doing the work. 
um, currently we have um, 304 unassigned guardian cases in Hennepin County, which translates to about 652 children who are not having a guardian or advocacy on their behalf in Hennepin County. This is the third year in a row that we have been unable to assign guardians to our cases, um, even though they're federally and state mandated to be on there. Um, a Hennepin County guardian is currently carrying 30 to 35 cases, which translates to about 60 to 80 children per case, some more. Some are carrying 90, 100 children on their caseload. And the cases are coming in at such an alarming rate that in a two-day period, we had 16 cases, brand new cases come in, in two days, which is exactly half of a full-time equivalent of a position. And so you can understand that during the course of this, we're going farther and farther behind. And the numbers uh, never did plateau. They just keep coming in. So it's been extremely difficult. Some of the things that we have done, uh, steps taken, I have converted several administrative positions to guardian positions um, to be able to try and cover those. I have also moved um, guardians from our family court over to juvenile court. So I have eight family court guardians. Two thirds of their caseload now are juvenile child protection cases. This of course has shorted our family court guardians with the information, or shorted our family court judicial officers with the information that these guardian ad litem can provide to those judges regarding specific children and recommendations. Mandatory family court cases um, always deal with an issue of abuse and neglect and the safety of the children. So we really are shorting um, the juvenile court judge or the family court judges with guardians available when we're talking about um, difficult safety issues also occurring in family court. Um, we also, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of the guardian. The guardian ad litem is oftentimes the only constant person who works with that child throughout the lifetime of that court case. Guardians develop a supportive and trusting relationship with these children. As we know, children who are forced to deal with trauma often have significant difficulties over the course of their lifetime. Studies show that a trusted person advocating for that child's best interest and building a strong personal relationship is the most significant factor determining whether that child suffers the negative effects of trauma or develops a positive resilience in dealing with this trauma. Protecting and advocating for the interests of Minnesota's most vulnerable children should be of the utmost importance to all of us striving to keep our children safe. An example of the outstanding unassigned cases that we have, I just want to go through a couple of them. Uh, one of them, we have a case involving eight children. The father is smoking meth in the bedroom of the house while the children are in the living room. The father is using and selling meth, and he is in charge of the four youngest children while the mother is at work. The home was raided, the dad was arrested, and the mom was sus had suspected he was using, but she had nobody else to watch her children and had to rely on him. Another case, um, the mother in this case was deceased. The child was residing with different relatives and friends when domestic incident occurred between a 16-year-old and the father. The child was assaulted by the father, hit 30 times or more with a hard object. Currently, the 16-year-old is four months pregnant and the father is facing criminal charges. Those are just two of the pages and pages and pages I now have of cases that we do not have guardians assigned to. Um, I also want to talk about in Hennepin County, 80% of our children in Hennepin County are children of color. Uh, that is a very high rate, and these children statewide are being denied the advocacy that they deserve um, and should have in Hennepin County. These children are falling through the cracks, and this is the third year that this is happening. They deserve our protection. We need your support, and um, I'm hoping that you are able to provide us with the funding that we need to continue this work. So I thank you very much for your time. I can answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from members? Okay. Great. I want to thank you for thank coming Thank you so here. much. Um, one, 
one comment I do want to make uh, brought up about the uh, from the guards talking about putting on a uniform and seeing what what's like in their world. I know uh, Representative Considine and myself, we did wear a uniform every day. We know what's, we understand what you go through and what your family goes through. Um, we want to do everything we can to help you, but sometimes there's only, only, can, only given so many dollars to work with. But I do, do understand and I want to make sure that you guys are safe. And with that, we will be adjourned. <laughs>